Well, it's just gone 9 a.m. in Washington, which means it is my great honour to open this year's Global Parliamentary Forum Town Hall with Chris Delina and David Malpass. And what I believe is a record number of parliamentarians who are joining us from around the world. You know, just a, a few months before the Bretton Woods Conference that created the IMF and the World Bank, President Roosevelt speculated about the kinds of goals he had for the post-war world. He talked about the world as a place where we could create economic security, social security and moral security. I think I speak for every parliamentarian on the call today when I say it feels like we're an awful long way away from those big goals today. The pandemic has killed six million of the people that we serve. Poverty has now claimed in its vice hundreds of millions more of the people that we serve. Price rises are eating into the livelihoods of billions of the people that we serve. And of course, war in the U Ukraine and in fragile states around the world means that we are losing people that we serve each and every day. This is an incredibly complicated landscape and no one and no one country can solve these problems on their own. That's why this year's Global Parliamentary Forum sees the launch of a new program for the parliamentary network for the year ahead. Our goal as we shift from the pandemic to the deadlines of the Paris Agreement is to try and build a world of green, inclusive and more shock proof growth. So over the year to come, we'll be organising special events about some of the big risks that we've now got to navigate, such as climate change, such as conflict, such as uh, corruption, such as new risks that we don't fully understand, like cryptocurrency. We'll be zeroing in on the big policy areas like jobs, fostering small businesses, building stronger health and education systems, and of course, debating how we mobilise the resources that we need to make the leaps that are needed in the years ahead, building new tax bases, using the Bretton Woods institutions better, and of course, forging a much stronger partnership with private sector long-term investors. Today's town hall gives us the chance at the Parliamentary Network, the opportunity to kick off this programme of work. And it also gives us the chance to salute the leadership, the courage and, and frankly, the creativity of both David Malpass and Kristalina at the IMF and the World Bank over the last year. From the new emergency package for the Ukraine to the work replenishing and deploying IDA to the incredible work around special drawing rights, plus everything else in between. This is the kind of leadership that the world needs right now. We know that the tougher the climb, the more important the leaders at the front. So David and Kristalina, on behalf of everybody here in the Parliamentary Network, a huge thank you to you for the extraordinary leadership over the last year and the great things that we know you're going to do over the year to come. So with that, the stage is set for our town hall today, and I'm going to hand straight over to Kristalina, who I think is going to open the bowling for us this morning. Kristalina, all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Liam, and I am not surprised that we have a record number of participation given the extraordinary times we are living in. Uh, just six months since the annual meetings, uh, we have lived through a turbulent time and uh, a crisis upon a crisis. First, the pandemic that has turned our lives upside down and it is not yet over. Second, Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has created a tremendous setback for the recovery from the pandemic. Uh, it is first and foremost a human tragedy for the people that are affected by the war those whose lives were unnecessarily lost, the 11 million people that are displaced inside and outside of the country, but it is also a tremendous negative impact for Ukraine, for Russia, and for the rest of the world. Let me recognize that the shockwaves are reaching fast and far. The most severely impacted are the neighbors that are more integrated with the, these two economies, but through commodity prices and especially food prices, energy prices, for, through the financial channels, impact on remittances, impact on the functioning 
of the world economy as a whole. And uh, last but not least, by the tensions that this war has created, we are now at the point when, if I am to sum it up in economic terms, growth is down, inflation is up. In human terms, people's incomes are down and hardship is up. And that is happening on the backdrop of another worrying trend, the risk of fragmentation of the global economy that threatens our ability as a global community to address these two crises, but also to deal with global challenges like climate change together. So what is that we see as priorities at the outset of our spring meetings? First, end the war. This is the most important instrument for us to help hundreds of millions of people. And in meanwhile, support Ukraine. We do all we can. We have provided swiftly $1.4 billion in emergency financing. We launched a special account that provides donors a secured way to further help Ukraine. And we work very closely with our partners, including with David Malpass, to make sure that the whole of our response is bigger than the sum of individual parts. Second, we cannot forget COVID-19. We uh, see how the outburst of infections in China, yet again, is hitting on supply chains, creating negative consequences for the world economy, not only uh, for China. Uh, we have analyzed uh, together with David Malpass uh, uh, and uh, with other partners in WHO, WTO and other institutions, what can be done. It is clear that a comprehensive plan that includes vaccines, but also testing, antiviral treatments, and more, more importantly, equitable distribution <clears throat> of these tools is necessary. We have concluded that at a fairly uh, acceptable cost, 15 billion this year, 10 billion in the following years, we can be much stronger in the face of the pandemic. Helping people, helping the world economy. Third, tackle inflation and debt. For the first time in many years, inflation has become a clear and present danger for many economies. It is creating hardships for ordinary people and uncertainty for businesses to invest. Central banks in this environment have to act decisively based on the uh, data uh, they rely on. Keeping their finger on the pulse of the economy and adjusting policies appropriately. So the actions are strong, but also well calibrated not to suppress unnecessarily growth. How to tighten monetary policy without jeopardizing the recovery is what we will be discussing at these uh, meetings. But tightening financial conditions adds to another problem that we face, and this is the high level of debt. We have seen in 2020 record high borrowing. Understandably, the world economy was put in a standstill. 2021 was still relatively easy. We had the DSSI for poor countries uh, and with very low interest rates for some servicing a bigger debt burden was actually cheaper than in 2020. No more in 2022 with tightening of financial conditions, the pressure of debt everywhere, but especially in low income countries is likely to become for some unbearable. We have been speaking loud and clear with David on this topic, asking for prudent implementation of the G20 common framework for uh, that resolution, and we will continue to engage on this topic during the meetings. We have seen doubling 
of countries at or near debt distress since 2015, from 30% to 60%. That cannot be left unattended now in a world of tighter financial conditions. Uh, we have been uh, engaged with individual countries uh, and uh, uh, maybe in the question time, we can talk more, more about this. Uh, fourth, we have to remain committed to build resilience. We are in a more shock prone world and we have to tackle not only the two crises upon us, but crises to come. And there are many aspects of resilience, inclusive economies, smart economies that benefit uh, but guard against the risk of digital uh, developments. Uh, and I want to focus on one topic, climate change has not gone away. IPCC came up with a report that reminds us we run out of time. At the IMF, we work very closely with the World Bank to be stronger in the face of this uh, crisis. And we just uh, launched based on the approval of our board, uh, the resilience and sustainability trust, a new pillar in our instruments specifically designed to provide affordable long-term financing to address existential challenges based on, on lending of SDRs. Uh, so let me finish by saying that in a world of more complex challenges, we can only succeed if we work together. You have a tremendously important role to speak up for people and to press us all to find solutions on the basis of what has served us well in the post Second World War year, era, and it is international collaboration. As the uh, Treasury Secretary of the US at the time of Bretton Woods said, prosperity like peace is indivisible and actions to uh, build prosperity are indivisible as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Kristalina, thank you so much indeed. And what a great note uh, to end on. It really is time to rediscover the spirit of Bretton Woods um, if we're to navigate some of the things that we've got in front of us. David, let me hand the floor uh, straight to you with a, a word of thanks for what was a really strong speech in, in Warsaw, um, flagging the reality that conflict is not just consuming um, Ukraine, but it is now spreading uh, far and wide through the developing world too. But David, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Liam, for chairing the parliamentary network uh, and for your opening remarks. And I want to say a very warm thank you to Kristalina for her insightful remarks just now, and even more for her work and her partnership. As she said just now, the whole of our work is more than the sum of the individual uh, parts. So it's, it's a pleasure to be with her today. Uh, I also want to say to the honorable members of parliament and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet with you once again. We're beginning our spring meetings facing severe overlapping crises, including COVID, inflation, and Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Um, COVID-19 continues to upend lives and livelihoods to kill people, and we cannot ignore that, but also we have to face the violent and heartbreaking events uh, that are taking place in Eastern Europe. There's simply no words to express the horror, the shock, uh, the, the, all the emotions that we feel for the Ukrainian people. Uh, the, the world is witnessing this in the daily images of war. Uh, and we are at the World Bank have uh, been reminded of our duty to act. And I'll, I want to describe that to you. I'm just back from a trip uh, last week to Poland and to Romania. I met with some of the refugees uh, and uh, we, we also announced an expansion of our Ukrainian uh, uh, aid program. And I'm sure there will be more uh, more steps in this regard uh, as, as we have our spring meetings this week. I'm deeply concerned about developing countries, and so I want to turn to that for a minute. 
The World Bank, as you know, uh, has a responsibility for all, for all of the developing countries and working in them at a time when there are sudden price increases for energy, for fer fertilizer and food, and also the likelihood of interest rate uh, increases. I was in Morocco and Senegal in March uh, and saw the, the direct impact that's occurring because of these uh, price increases. Um, that that w w They're facing those uh, price increases, shortages, as well as the war in, in Ukraine. And now we have China's COVID-related shutdowns, uh, which, are, which are all coming together to push down global growth rates and push poverty rates even higher. Uh, we, we've uh, lowered our 2022 growth forecast and we expect it to be another difficult year for developing countries. People are, let me t say a word on that. People are facing reversals in development uh, this is this is stunning. This is heartbreaking. Meaning, going backward in terms of poverty numbers, in terms of years of education, the literacy rates, the health uh, health rates, uh, and uh, gender equality, all, all taking a taking a back step, which is uh, which is uh, heart wrenching. Heart uh, wrenching, um, and they're facing. Uh, commercial activity that and trade that have uh, shut down in many ways. We at the World Bank, including the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, are trying to work to keep trade lines open and to keep working capital available for some of the businesses so they can they can maintain. Uh, we also have the debt crisis and currency depreciations, uh, with, with much of the burden falling on the poor. So that brings me to the inequality challenge that we're facing worldwide, uh, that, that uh, 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 what, what, what we have seen is the, a, an allocation of capital that continues to go to the upper end of the income scale and to countries that are advanced economies. And that's been leaving uh, the, the developing countries uh, behind, and especially the poorest uh, of the developing countries. So that's a challenge that leads directly into fragility. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's a topic that we discussed in detail at the Munich Security Conference in February. And I was also in Brussels for the EU, AU, European Union, African Union Summit, uh, where leaders were in from Africa and discussing the challenge of uh, fragility. I want to come back for a minute and say what we're doing in Ukraine specifically. That's, uh, that's a, a, a vital topic for the direction of the world. We've mobilized nearly $1 billion in emergency financing. And in Poland last week, I announced another $1.5 billion to support essential government services. We're pulling together uh, 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 trust funds and co-financing and guarantees from various governments around the world, which is helping immensely. And we encourage that it can expand the very uh, fast dispersing money that we're providing to the government of Ukraine for the maintenance of basic services, such as hospital workers. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to spend uh, a minute on food insecurity. Kristalina and I, and along with David Beasley and uh, uh, Ngozi, issued a joint call last week on on uh, for for governments to do more. We have to recognize the the this is a a, a long would likely to be a uh, a crisis that extends m many months and into the years because. The energy crisis is contributing to a fertilizer crisis, which uh, contributes to a planting uh, crisis, not enough uh, planting able to go on in some parts of the world. And so it's incumbent on governments to increase their supply, increase their plantings and their ability of farmers to plant, uh, and also to open their markets. A critical a critical step in dealing with the uh, immediacy of this food crisis is for the advanced economies to uh, uh, reduce their trade barriers uh, and the, also the developing countries themselves to reduce their trade barriers so there can be a, a more efficient allocation of the food that is available. So I really encourage people to look at this and recognize uh, that uh, uh, faced with the inflation 
And with the food price surges and the, the likelihood that the energy crisis is going to continue uh, w w well into the future, uh, it's incumbent on countries uh, to improve their trade policies by allowing more trade across borders. Uh, and and that, that I think needs to be a high priority for, for the world. And that was one of the topics of the joint uh, uh, letter, the joint uh, announcement that we made last week. Um, I want to say a, a word about the, the World Bank uh, program. As you know, we did a, uh, uh, a record buildup in the size of our program uh, for COVID. Uh, in the 15 months uh, ending in June of 2021, uh, we were able to increase, to, to uh, make commitments of $157 billion of financing. That was a 60% uh, increase from the previous 15 months, which is a huge surge for the World Bank and, and a record, uh, a, a record uh, set of commitments. We're now, uh, uh, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be discussing with our board uh, a response envelope for the current crisis. We're recognizing that the COVID was a major crisis. We now have a, a set of overlapping crises that are just as bad or maybe worse, uh, uh, likely worse than COVID. So we have an envelope of around $170 billion uh, that would be for the 15 month period starting now with April of 2022. Uh, and we're expecting within that package to commit around $50 billion uh, over, over this current three month period that we're in. It's the it's the fourth quarter of our fiscal of our fiscal year. As we do this scale up, um, uh, we have increased our climate financing and technical support to over twenty six billion dollars in fiscal twenty one alone. That's our highest level ever. Uh, we have. Uh, challenges, and Europe is very aware of the challenges in building uh, a stronger electric grid that can absorb more renewables and also maintain base load. I was pleased to see uh, Ukraine synchronizing its uh, electric grid with that of Western Europe over the, uh, in, in the last uh, two weeks. That's a powerful that's a powerful connection that can allow uh, exports of electricity from Ukraine and can encourage the rebuilding effort that we look for uh, in that region. Um, debt is important and I'll just, uh, I, I won't uh, repeat what you've seen so far. Kristalina and I have, have been working hard on it. We have uh, made concrete suggestions for the improvement in the implementation of the, of the G20 <clears throat> Uh, common framework. This is a vital step for the world, given the, uh, the, the deepening debt crises that are facing the developing world from Sri Lanka and uh, Suriname to Zambia and Chad. Uh, but it's going to involve many more countries because there's so many in high risk of debt dis distress. We estimate uh, that there are 60% of the uh, low income countries are either in debt distress or, or uh, highly at risk of debt distress. So it's a, it's a major problem for, for world leaders to uh, consider and move forward on in, in uh, improving and strengthening the common framework. Um, with, with that, uh, I'll, I'll close a little bit where I opened the, the crisis of security. Um, I was at the Brussels and Munich uh, conferences. Uh, leaders around the world are are, are straining to find a way to create stability in their countries that can then allow investment and growth and pull forward in terms of the development efforts that they're undertaking. So I, I think we need to have a full commitment to security, to stability, to peace, and that involves constant efforts to strengthen institutions. Uh, so with, with that thought, I look forward to the discussion today. Um, thank you, Liam. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly uh, rich analysis and a very rich um, package of proposals as well. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and very much agree with just um, we're seeing a misallocation of capital as people fly to safety. But we're also seeing lots of countries around the world now talk about how supply chains will need to get cut up and, and re-pieced into proposals to either nearshore or friendshore and, and actually it just underlines the point that we need to confront this in a 
in a united way. Um, for folks watching around the world, please use the Q&A function to pop in your questions. I'm going to get through as many uh, of those questions as I can over the course of the next uh, half an hour. Um, but let me just um, pose the first four or five questions that have come through uh, from parliamentarians watching around the world. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, but it would be good to get any further reflections on spillovers from the Ukraine. Uh, lots of us remember how the Arab Spring began. And what we're now seeing are some very similar preconditions. Uh, wheat prices uh, up over 80 percent, maize prices up over 40 percent, uh, very sharp rises in gas prices, too. Um, so that, that's my kind of first question. What other spillovers do you foresee? How long do you foresee that unfolding for? Uh, I think second, given the packages, this is coming from one of our colleagues in Senegal, um, given the help that you've very radically and rapidly assembled for the Ukraine, but also given the crises that you've both set out, give us uh, a little bit more detail on how you think both the fund and the bank will be supporting those countries that are in uh, real distress or on the threshold of, of real distress. Um, now, part of that is a third question from one of our board members in Spain, um, which is obviously to within those packages, ask the question about health support. So are there particular ambitions or particular proposals that you've got about health support? Both of you have done extraordinary work on setting out what the global roadmap for uh, safeguards against infectious diseases look like. How do we now build a better immune system for the world? How do we learn from um, many of the mistakes that have been made to strengthen health systems in the future? Are there new risks? Uh, Christine, you, you touched on this en passant about uh, in digitalization, uh, many of us are now beginning to see the growth of cryptocurrency in our countries. Is that a new risk that we need to begin thinking about? It's a topic we want to come back to as a network. Um, and then the final question, I guess, in this round is just um, say a little bit more about the role for parliamentarians, both domestically, uh, but also in some of the multilateral discussions that need to be had. So, for example, parliamentarians in G20 countries, for example, it feels to us like we've got a really strong set of ideas that we need to put to our governments in order to ensure more coordinated um, global action. Uh, David, I wonder if I could come to you first and then come to Kristalina on some of those points. Thanks very, very much, uh, Liam. That's a that's a handful. Let me let me touch on some as the Arab Spring was uh, was a terrible moment because of the food insecurity, uh, and then it led to political changes, some of which were were beneficial, some not so beneficial. Uh, I want to really distinguish what we're in now uh, from previous crises. Um, if we think of the 1970s, it was characterized by a devaluation of the world from the gold standard, an end of a of a of an era that had lasted hundreds of years or more. Uh, and so that, that uh, led to a global price increase that was inflation or hyperinflation. I don't see that we have those characteristics now. We have, uh, as I discussed in my remarks, the importance of adding supply. And uh, I think central banks can do more and governments in their fiscal policies can do more to think about how do they add supply rather than just demand, which has been the, the, the COVID response so far. Um, it's also different, the current crisis is different from the 2009, 2008 was a, was a gigantic financial collapse of the world financial system. We don't have those elements now. So the reason I give that background as we think about what's the problem now, it is that the world had been dependent on, uh, on energy from Russia and uh, that, that, is, that, that has not worked well and there aren't alternative supplies. That, that this is a giant, a long lasting crisis for including for parliamentarians, for governments to think about where will our energy come from and how much more are we willing to pay than, than what Russia was selling it at. And it has to do with the, just the magnitude of Russia's participation in global energy markets and the lead time that's needed to create natural gas supplies uh, uh, around the world. I think the proper response uh, and I've, I've been talking about it, that markets are forward looking. So if the markets know that three years from now there will be adequate supply, uh, then they will price that in now. 
Uh, and so I think there is hope uh, for the, for the uh, direction of the world if there's enough clarity by world leaders that their intention is to increase supply. Uh, and if that's the case, then prices will begin to come down right away, uh, and that will relieve some of the burden. So I wanted to mention that. We, we are having, with regard to uh, Ukraine and food insecurity, we're having two important uh, uh, events this week. On Ukraine, on Thursday, there's an important uh, uh, event of, uh, of, of uh, uh, those countries that are very engaged in the, uh, in the Ukraine effort. Uh, and they'll, they'll, the Prime Minister of Poland is, ex, uh, the, is uh, uh, expected to uh, uh, come uh, and, uh, and others from the, from, uh, for, I'm sorry, of Ukraine and from the Ukrainian delegation. So this is, will be an important uh, uh, discussion point. And then on food insecurity, and I know Kristalina may add, add to this, we're, we're expecting uh, forums on both uh, Tuesday and on Thursday where there can be specific conversations on, uh, on that. So this will be important. And final point I wanted to make, and I'll be speaking with Nadia uh, Calvino um, later, I think later today, about the uh, about the uh, coordinated efforts that are needed uh, in order to pull to to pull together the 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 the, uh, the these meetings this week, but also the the size of uh, funding and the 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 role of parliaments within the global dialogue. Um, my observation: I was just in uh, Poland and and Romania, which have very different political situations with their parliaments. It's interesting to see the role of the cabinets, the presidents, the prime ministers, and the differential in their in the way politics is uh, uh, is forming. And I guess I can encourage everyone on the call to be tolerant of different points of view, to recognize that there are that that there are legitimate different answers in terms of the direction that we're at a crisis point in the world in a number of areas. And there should be expected to be different points of view. And then the role of leaders is to bring together those points of view and find the best possible answer. So I just encourage everyone in that direction. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Kristalina, uh, over to you. Uh, I, I will compliment uh, to a great degree what David said. Uh, let me start first with what is uh, ahead of us um, and uh, are we to expect a uh, stagflation, dramatic developments this year. Uh, tomorrow we are going to uh, announce our projections for growth. We are going to downgrade 146 countries in terms of their growth projections for 22. This is 86% of the GDP of our planet. But despite of that, for majority of countries, growth would remain in positive territory. So in that sense, we are concerned about the uh, setback in the recovery, and yet we see the year finishing on a positive uh, note in terms of global growth. Inflation is actually the bigger danger. The central banks have the tools to address it. And what we are seeing as signals is that action, decisive action is being taken. So from our perspective, the biggest risk to watch is how this tightening of financial conditions is going to impact countries that have yet to recover from COVID, but are hit by another wave of a crisis. And whether this divergence in economic fortunes we have seen is going to deepen even further. What is the kind of really bad news? We have scarring from the pandemic and it is now exacerbated by the impact of the war uh, in Ukraine. So what we see is for emerging markets and developing economies, the return to their pre-pandemic levels slipping even further into the future. Uh, in 2026, we expect that 
this group of countries would be still 6% below the trajectory before the pandemic. So what does it mean? And this takes me to uh, the uh, second question. What can we do to help Ukraine, but also to help emerging markets and developing economies affected by this crisis, by this du dual crisis? Uh, obviously, we have to recognize uh, that there would be group of countries that would require much more forward leaning from the international community in terms of support. The IMF during the pandemic has extended over $170 billion of financial support to our members. That means that out of the $1 trillion financing we have uh, available, in total, $300 billion is utilized and $700 billion is available. We have the resources, the firing power to help our members. And we are all ready for those that are in the toughest uh, environment, countries like Sri Lanka, Lebanon. We are stepping forward, working on programs. Uh, we are also working with countries that are taking precautionary steps like Egypt to come to the fund and say, well, we, we can handle, but we want to be more secured. And uh, we would see uh, a, a high likelihood that there would be countries coming for programs and countries coming for augmentation of programs, especially those that are faced with a dramatic food crisis. We are ready uh, to do that. On the health support front, a very important question. Uh, yes, we have to deal with the pandemic today, but also build health systems for the future. And there the World Bank has been a leading uh, institution. Uh, at the IMF, we do two things, one, the analytics as to what is necessary in terms of social policies to build healthier societies for the future. Uh, and uh, we have introduced a concept of a floor for social spending. We are analyzing more thoroughly what should be done in countries, how policies can build resilience of people for the future. And secondly, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust uh, that our board approved as designed uh, at this point of time has two objectives, resilience to climate shocks, in other words, building low carbon climate resilient economies, what are the policies we can support and resilience to future pandemics. Uh, and there again, our partnership with, with the World Bank cannot be overstated. The World Bank has the sectoral expertise, the IMF has the uh, advantage of talking with ministers of finance on broad policies and supporting uh, these resilient uh, policies. And uh, uh, a point on the new risks, uh, the very, uh, you're right, uh, Liam, to say that uh, uh, the pandemic put digitalization on steroids. And that applies also to the world of money. What we have seen is a huge increase of uh, uh, crypto assets, um, stable coins, as well as massive interest in central bank digital currencies. Uh, this is overall a, a good, uh, good development because it allows low cost financial transactions, uh, payment systems that can include more people and businesses uh, in a world where we still have 1.7 billion people that are unbanked but it brings very significant risks. Number one risk in our view is the uh, massive increase of crypto assets uh, that are very different in their reliability. Uh, to use Bitcoin as an example, very volatile, and yet there is some interest to make them to be currencies, but how can you have a currency that is not a predictable store of value? Uh, we are also concerned that the uh, stable coins are not yet regulated to a point that they can be part of the financial system without creating risks. With crypto assets now being two trillion, obviously the issue of regulating them uh, having standards that are globally accepted uh, uh, becomes very uh, pressing. On central bank digital currencies, 
uh, we did a survey of our membership and over a hundred countries said they are now in this world. They are working on, on central bank uh, digital currencies. Obviously, if everybody does that separately, there will be no interoperability and we would be in a very fragmented world. Uh, the uh, institutions engaged like uh, FSB, the uh, Bank for International Settlement, uh, IMF, we are very mindful that time is not our friend, not on our side. Uh, so we are working very hard to give the world a sound foundation so we can have the advantage of digitalization of uh, money, but also deal with the risks. And one of these risks, uh, the uh, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine made even more visible. This is the risk of cyber uh, attacks. Uh, uh, so we, we have to be uh, working together to bring these risks as much down as possible. Excellent. Thank you so much. much comprehensive answers there. Uh, the, the clock is slightly against us. So we're into the final quarter of an hour. I've just got, um, so let me just hone down the second package of questions, just to, to, to three or four key topics that have come in um, from our members. Um, question from Turkey is about climate finance. Um, lots of us who were at uh, COP in, in Glasgow left a, a little disappointed um, that the international community hadn't stepped up to what it needed to do on climate finance. Um, despite the extraordinary work that both the fund and the bank have done, we're particularly interested in, uh, we're looking forward to the rollout of uh, CCDRs, David, as I, as I think they're called. That's obviously going to be a really significant pol policy instrument for understanding um, climate uh, plans in, in each country. Um, but if you could say a word about how you see climate finance in the run-up to Sharm el Sheikh COP and what needs to be done before then, that'd be incredibly helpful. Um, and then a question from Tanzania, which is about, you know, is there additional support that the IMF and the bank will be able to flex in to help countries deal with the surge in prices, short term as it may be? Um, and then final question, um, again, from Africa is about this question of, of debt, uh, pausing debt paybacks, uh, potentially the write off of debt. Um, and David, that maybe that gives us the chance just to get into something that you have consistently underlined about uh, debt transparency, which is which is still not there. Um, because, you know, one of the big takeaways from this conversation is both the fund and the bank are not saying to the world community, we're undercapitalized. Uh, what you're saying is that actually we've got significant tools to do the job, but we need to make sure that things like SDRs are being rechanneled in a way that really rhymes and helps leverage some of the new funding that David has talked about. And crucially, that needs to be used to help leverage in the significant trillions of pension fund investment that signed up to principles for responsible uh, investment. So, um, Kristalina, maybe I could ask you to pick that up first and, and then I'll come to David. And if we've got time, I'll ask you to then move on to some closing remarks and then we'll wrap up ahead of the hour. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the uh, the um, big achievement in uh, Glasgow was uh, countries making commitments to 2050, some slightly <clears throat> beyond 2050 of net zero and the finance community being there as never before uh, saying, look, there is $130 trillion that can help this transition. Well, the big shortcoming is that we are still not seeing this money going where they're most needed in emerging markets and developing economies. And why is that so? mostly because of perceived or real risk. So it is clear that our institutions, <laughs> bank, the fund and others, we have a huge responsibility to work on reducing this risk. Uh, what the bank is doing with uh, 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 national plans, having credible assessment of what the priorities are, what the fund is doing on the policy side so you have sound transparent policies that give the investor confidence to go in emerging markets. All of this matters and it has to be brought on a scale that finally, finally, this notion that we can use billions to move trillions uh, turns into reality. I think uh, in uh, Egypt, we would see very important focus on one aspect of climate financing and it is for adaptation. Uh, given that uh, this is a COP in Africa. Uh, and I think it is very important that we do think of finance for adaptation at par with finance for mitigation and transition, because 
uh, we have already are in a place where climate risks are present. Uh, for the fund, we want to see our resilience and sustainability trust as much as possible directed to removing policy obstacles for private investment in um, climate in emerging markets in developing uh, countries, building on collaboration, especially with the World Bank and also with other institutions. Um, on, on the question of search in a crisis, what can be done? Well, um, David made a very important point. The world has to concentrate on predictably stepping up supply of food and energy. Uh, and that is not easy, but not impossible. Uh, and especially on food, not allowing barriers for trade that could significantly affect poor countries, leading to shortages of food, price hikes, and uh, possibly social unrest. Uh, so we see our role in the highly uh, uh, pressing in time discussion on food security it is about this month, not about some time in the future. And it combines both more food production in advanced economies where this is possible, but also improving agricultural productivity in, uh, in developing countries and moving food supplies in a way that allows poor countries to protect uh, their people. And uh, finally, on the question of, of debt, uh, look, this is now uh, a, a very pressing uh, uh, problem. Uh, David and, 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 and I have been working on debt transparency for a reason. Unless you know what the debt is composed of, how can you possibly restructure it effectively? How can you get everybody at the table? Uh, but we also need a recognition that uh, for some low income countries, debt restructuring does mean cutting debt to a size that the country can serve, uh, not only moving it somewhere sometime in the, in the future. Uh, and that can be done on a country by country uh, level effectively. We might be in a place where if we don't act in the next months, there could be a risk of multiple defaults. We have seen uh, uh, Sri Lanka defaulting. We don't want that wave to start. And therefore, those countries that are already pressing for that restructuring, it has to be done. Where you can help, please advocate, uh, especially to the countries that are significant, play significant role as lenders, advocate for determined action on that now. Perfect. And for those who want to debate this further, join us at nine o'clock tomorrow um, for our parliamentary network session on uh, debt, debt management, transparency um, and some of the issues that Crystal has displayed. And um, David, over to you now. Final answers and then we'll move to wrap up. Thank you, uh, Liam. I'll try to go qu quickly because uh, Kristalina said said a lot of great points. I'll, I'll go in reverse order. I'll do debt and then surge in prices and then climate. Um, and with regard to debt, um, the the uh, the thing I want to emphasize is the earlier that there this can be resolved, the better because then the country can begin attracting investment. It's it's a it's a blockage. Uh, when there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We've, we've uh, uh, advocated several steps to make the common framework be better. One is uh, to establish a timeline for forming the creditors committee. Uh, two, which you, for Zam Zambia and Ethiopia, you know, don't even have creditors committees established. Uh, we've uh, called for suspension of debt service payments and, and pen including penalty interest, uh, expanding the eligibility uh, and then clear on the comparability of uh, treatment. Uh, World Bank has, has advocated a simple rule so that comparability of treatment can be evaluated and enforced. Uh, and these are important. Uh, and we've also advocated engaging the commercial creditors very early in the process. Uh, these, would, uh, these would allow some chance of the uh, common framework uh, moving forward again. Right now, it's stalled. And the 
problem is mounting because so many countries are in debt distress and the interest rates are probably going up worldwide. Um, turning to the, uh, 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 to the surge in prices, uh, Kristalina said it very well. So it, we, we need more supply and, and allocation process uh, that, that uh, avoids having uh, huge distortions. For one type of distortion is if a country puts a cap on the price of food, uh, then it ends up uh, misallocating the food rapidly within the country to the people that can get a hold of the uh, shortage of supply. So there's got to be some, some kind of social safety net that protects the most vulnerable as, uh, as people around the world uh, work to uh, create more supply of, of food, but also of fertilizer and of energy. That becomes very important in this to increase the supply of energy in, uh, in countries Around, uh, around the world. And there are known techniques for that. That means, uh, 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 and I, I'll express one set of frustration on that. Uh, as, as you may know, the US puts a lot of, uh, of uh, expenditure into ethanol, turning ethanol into energy, and that comes from corn. So you end up diverting the corn crop uh, in order to put it into uh, automobiles. And I, I, I just have great deal of trouble in that I, I, I use that example because it's it, it's it, it's uh, it hits home I'm a, American uh, but I think worldwide countries need to look for ways to open their markets so that there can be more trade across borders uh, and that will be a powerful response to the surge in prices um, with regard to climate um, Glasgow uh, made made uh, commitments the, it's important to turn those into actions what we're doing at the World Bank is we have a climate change action plan uh, that is based on identifying uh, the big emitters of greenhouse gas uh, and, and finding uh, plans for those countries to reduce their emissions. Uh, the, uh, what, the diagnostic that we're using is the Country Climate Development Report, CCDRs. Uh, and uh, we now have CCDRs underway that will cover 3 billion people around the world. And we think it may capture 42% of the green of the human made greenhouse gas emissions that are coming out. So we've, we've uh, tried to identify the big emitters uh, and then develop uh, uh, ideas, uh, plans on which they could reduce those emissions. The challenge then becomes uh, a uh, giant management challenge to bring in the funding from the global community. These are expensive uh, 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 global public goods projects uh, that the countries won't be able to do on their own. So bringing in giant amounts of new financing and then managing it through the project phase. This, uh, the project phase is a role that the World Bank can play and other multilateral development banks uh, working with the governments uh, to implement their indices or if the indices are not aimed at greenhouse gas emissions to set up a system within the countries where they can, uh, they can do that. And the same thing on adaptation. So these are giant efforts, they're underway. We have to keep in mind SDG seven, which is electricity access for people. Uh, I, I was uh, just in Eastern Europe and the, the issues of where will the base load come from and how can the grids be maintained. Huge amounts of money need to be put into the grids in order to allow them to uh, absorb more renewables. Uh, and so these are all uh, funding challenges for the global community as they look to put uh, uh, huge amounts, which, and we need to be candid about this, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars uh, from from the uh, global community into into uh, into greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, uh, programs in individual countries. Thanks, Liam. Brilliant. Um, just an incredibly exciting set of things that are about to unfold um, this year. So, look, that brings us to the top of the hour. That brings us to the end of our time together. We've got uh, just a couple of minutes left, Christina. Any a sort of a final word, final thirty seconds for parliamentarians? What do you want to see parliamentarians take out of this week? Do reach out to each other, work together. Uh, the uh, danger of fragmentation is real. And uh, if we allow the world to turn into separate blocks with separate currencies, uh, we are going to all be poorer in the future. Let's remember that we got 
in the last decades, a uh, tripling of the world economy since 1990. Yeah. It has translated into reducing poverty from 2 billion people to 650, 650 million too many. Uh, if we want to continue on this path of prosperity, we have to deal with the shortcomings of globalization. It didn't benefit everyone, and that has to be recognized and dealt with. But we also have to find a way for the world to go together, because otherwise we just cannot cope. So please, in this week, work, reach out to each other, work together. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Great message. And uh, David, let me give you the final word. It, 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 she's uh, Crystalina is exactly right. And so the interlinked crises, and we have to look at security, we have to 